Exposed is a presentation of Texas Scorecard and made possible by donations from listeners like you. Visit texasscorecard.com slash donate to make a tax-deductible contribution. The crisis at the southern border grabs our attention because it's messy and costly. It's mean-looking cartel members shuffling emancipated people into the United States carrying drugs, disease, and illegal weapons. Those images have dulled us to the other very real infiltration going on that is perhaps even more dire. In ancient mythology, the people of Troy were expecting armed soldiers to be knocking against their city walls. They didn't expect to see a massive, beautifully carved horse sitting outside. Some might have been suspicious, but the city's politicians, so eager to declare a victory and accept this gift, opened up the gates and that Trojan horse set their city on a path to destruction. Directly and indirectly, the communist Chinese government and its surrogates have been infiltrating Texas. In this series, we've already looked at how their front men now own tens of thousands of acres of Texas land, some of it adjacent to military installations, gobbling up food production and even seeking to tap into our power grid. We've seen how they've wormed their way into the state's research institutions, our universities, and even our public schools. And the worst part? Our Texas politicians, just like those in Troy, have let it happen. I'm Michael Quinn Sullivan. This is Exposed, Season 3, The Chinese Infiltration of Texas. It's crazy enough just to allow our biggest enemy to be purchasing our own soil. We should actively carry out international propaganda battles. It's crazy to me that a Chinese company could even be able to hire a lobbyist in Austin. Everyone spies, right? Nobody admits to it. That's sort of the point, right? That just appears to be how these things go. Hanban is just like the sun. It lights the path to develop Chinese teaching in the U.S. China has entered really into a total police and a digital you know, tyranny. This season of Exposed brings together research conducted by the Texas Scorecard team over many months. Frankly, each episode is just scratching the surface of China's infiltration into Texas. If you'd like to learn more, see the original documents, and do your own follow-up research, visit texasscorecard.com slash China. An untold number of Chinese refugees in the United States have fled the persecution and tyranny of China's totalitarian communist government. There's men like Bob Fu, who heads China Aid, in an effort to, in his words, We work with the persecuted brothers and sisters by exposing the abuses for the persecution of Christians and others in China. You'll hear more from Mr. Fu in a coming episode. But this episode is focused on the politicians who have been opening the door for the communist Chinese infiltration of Texas. Using their connections and the bully pulpit of their public offices, Republicans and Democrats, presidents and mayors, there's been a bipartisan, all-of-government push to welcome the Communist Chinese Party into the United States. The most egregious example is incumbent State Representative Gene Wu, a Democrat first elected to his House district in 2012. Born in China, Wu is best known for two things. One, his outrageous social media posts giving adulating support to the communist oppressors in China. The other thing he's known for is being the spouse of Maya Shea, a reporter for ABC 13 in Houston, who was also born in China. Shea's work on TV is notable, not only for her extreme liberal bias, but her puff pieces on the Chinese government. We'll talk about her more in a moment. In advance of the series, Gene Wu was repeatedly given opportunities to explain his statements, positions, and close connections with China. He refused. That's okay, because he's said plenty. In this episode, a voice actor will be used to read Gene Wu's social media posts. Mr. Wu, though, isn't the only Texas political insider using connections to help the communists in China advance their goals.
Perhaps the most notable would be the nonprofit foundation set up in Houston by Neil Bush. He set up this foundation with the blessing of his father, the late former President George H.W. Bush. Sometimes its name gets confused with the George H.W. Bush Library and Museum at Texas A&M. The confusion doesn't seem accidental. You might remember our second episode in the series focused on the CCP's infiltration of universities and public schools. Texas A&M played a big part in welcoming Chinese money and propaganda into higher education and into our state's K-12 public school systems through the Confucius Institutes pushed by the Communist Party in China. But for this episode, we're discussing the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations in Houston. On its website, the organization seeks, quote, to advance the U.S.-China relations in ways that reflect the ethos, spirit, and values of President George H.W. Bush, end quote. What was the ethos of George H.W. Bush as it relates to China? Appeasement. Following the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989, it was George H.W. Bush who urged the world not to impose sanctions for the horror. It was President George H.W. Bush who wanted everyone to move on from the horrific images. So let's look at the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations, trading as it does in Texas on the name of a former president. Ying McGuire sits on the foundation's board of advisors. She also was part of the shadowy U.S.-China Innovation Alliance, also known as the UCIA, which has been widely recognized as a conduit for CCP infiltration into American and Texan commerce and government. Reportedly, the UCIA is now defunct. They had addresses in either Houston or Austin with directors from both China and the U.S., Meanwhile, David Firestein is president and CEO of both the Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations and the executive director of the China Public Policy Center at the University of Texas, Austin. Interestingly, the work of the China Public Policy Center is nestled under the LBJ School of Public Affairs. That would be LBJ, the late former U.S. President Lyndon Baines Johnson. As we have seen, disturbingly close affiliations with the CCP bridges the gap between Republicans and Democrats, Aggies and Longhorns. Let's go back to the board of the Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations, where we meet Florence Fang. According to her bio, she serves as an honorary trustee at Peking University and an honorary professor at Wuhan University. Both Wuhan University and Peking University are tightly affiliated with the People's Liberation Army of China, with the institutions doing high-level military research. Wuhan University in particular is suspected of carrying out cyber attacks on behalf of the Chinese military. The board chairman for the Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations is Neil Bush, the late president's son, who has extensive business interests in and around China. His website biography leads with his more than 140 trips to China over the years. Just as George H.W. Bush, back in 1989, called on Western leaders to dampen down their anger and rhetoric over the Tiananmen Square massacre and extend the hand of friendship to the tyrannical government, so too does the Bush China Foundation push for Americans to ignore the CCP's stated goals and tyrannical practices. Their focus is on what the well-heeled and connected can get out of a friendly relationship with the CCP. In that sense, the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations is performing as advertised. So far in the series, we've talked about the moves the Chinese Communist Party has made in Texas, buying up land, food production, and turning institutions of public education into propaganda arms. What are they after? An ongoing debate in the Texas legislature is revealing. Beijing once came close to getting the Texas legislature to sign off on their drone surveillance of us. Evidence suggests they're gearing up to try again. This is Robert Montoya. He heads Texas Scorecard's investigative team and oversaw this entire investigation. In the 2019 legislative session, 
two companies tried to push through changes that would have expanded drone usage and the data they can collect, while capping restrictions on both. These efforts were defeated thanks in large part to Republican State Representative Tony Tinderholt of Arlington. Amazon was one of the companies pushing for this. The other was DJI. Amazon is a name everyone knows, but DJI is a name you should know. DJI stands for Dajang Innovations. The company is intimately tied in with the Chinese Communist Party. According to research from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, 80% of the drone market in North America and 70% of the global market is supplied by DJI. DJI's founder and CEO is politically connected in China, as you would expect, and party money has, I hope you'll pardon the pun, flown through DJI. The Communist Party really wants DJI equipment flying around Texas and the United States. Tony Tinderholt explains it this way. The Chinese and other countries are always collecting data. And what, they, what we call that data is EEFI, EFIs. They're essential elements of friendly information. It's things they can collect through the newspaper. They can collect it from the news. They can collect it by talking to military members. They can collect it by using drones. Drones, he said. DJI was asked in an interview, do you ever give the data from these drones to the Chinese government, meaning do you give any of the video footage that's uploaded to the cloud? Do you give paths that are used? And the answer was yes. Back in 2017, the U.S. Army banned all DJI drone usage, and in 2018, the DOD banned the buying and use of any commercial off-the-shelf drones because of the communist Chinese espionage threat. In 2020, DJI was placed on the U.S. Department of Commerce's list of enemy companies. But remember, they have 80% of the U.S. marketplace. In April 2020, DJI was donating drones to police and fire departments in 22 states, including Texas. This has Representative Tinderholt very concerned as a lawmaker and as a military veteran. We need to make sure law enforcement... National Guard, Air Guard, firefighters, anyone that's working for the government is not buying, paying for, and using these. A 2019 fight in the Texas legislature is illustrative. Remember, this came after the U.S. Army and Department of Defense identified DJI as a bad actor. DJI hired a team of Democrat and Republican lobbyists. Notably, they hired Adam Goldman. Notable because his brother is State Representative Craig Goldman, a Fort Worth Republican. Notable because Craig Goldman is tightly aligned with the leadership in the Texas House. U.S. Representative Lance Gooden is frustrated that anyone would lobby for a company like DJI. It's crazy to me that a Chinese company so closely aligned with the Communist Party could even be able to hire a lobbyist in Austin. The effort by DJI and Amazon to loosen drone restrictions was bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats alike were trying to cozy up to the Chinese effort. Their preferred legislative vehicle was a measure by Democrat State Senator Judith Zaffarini. The measure died in the Senate. A House bill by then-State Representative and now State Senator Drew Springer, a Republican from Munster, was known as the mother of all drone bills. It gave Amazon and DJI everything they wanted and more. It was this measure that Tinderholt killed in the House, only to see it brought back as an amendment on the House floor to different legislation. It was close, but DJI and Amazon were defeated. But they haven't backed down. Records show the companies appear to be gearing up for another fight with a new team of lobbyists. State records show Brad Slater, Stan Slater, and Kathy DeWitt were all retained by DJI to lobby for them in the coming legislative session. The records are clear. The Texas Ethics Commission shows DJI as a prospect for each of them. However, when we called them, they denied having DJI as a client. It's unclear why they filled out paperwork with the state saying they would lobby for DJI, but now claim that was a mistake. Since then, they filed paperwork to have DJI removed as a prospective client. This brings us back to State Representative Gene Wu the Houston Democrat, and his TV reporter wife, Mia Shea. 
They have traveled to China with a delegation of Texas politicians and always seem to be on hand when Communist Party leaders from China visit Texas. In late July 2020, the U.S. government ordered the closure of China's consulate in Houston. The Department of State found the Houston Chinese consulate had engaged in activities such as visa fraud and research theft. The government also believed the facility was a front for CCP espionage efforts against the United States. In the hours after it was ordered closed, consulate officials were seen burning documents and other incriminating evidence. Upon learning that China's consulate was being ordered to close, State Representative Wu was outraged at the United States. He was outraged that a base of espionage and criminal activity was being shut down. Again, Mr. Wu was given the opportunity to be interviewed, and he declined. Here's what he posted to social media. This is madness. Congress was not even informed. Rational nations don't act like this. This is Trump trying to start an actual war and distract from his poor COVID-19 performance and sinking political numbers. Wu wasn't mad that China was caught spying on the U.S. He was mad that a U.S. president was doing something about it. This is where Maya Shea enters the picture. Of all the journalists in Houston, she was given exclusive access to the consulate's head diplomat, the head spy, who was being ordered out of the consulate building. Her interview was a softball full of criticisms of the United States. On the trip. And so that's it. You didn't give them false documents? You didn't carry any false documents? Oh, no, no. And that, so that's, again... I, when people I criticized think, yeah. her reporting, Shay took to social media. She wrote on Twitter, Everyone spies, right? Nobody admits to it. That's sort of the point, right? That just appears to be how these things go. It's one thing to be proud of your national heritage, and certainly Chinese Americans have a lot to be proud of from their cultural history. Yet Wu and Shea are ardent defenders not of the Chinese culture, but of the Chinese Communist Party. Any criticism of the CCP, they respond personally, deflecting any and all questions as a matter of racism. They seem to have a lot to hide when it comes to the Chinese infiltration of Texas. China's engagement in land, food, education, politics, it all points in two equally disturbing directions. The first threat, as identified in this episode by State Representative Tony Tinderholt, is the angle of national security. The Communist Chinese Party's front groups and cutouts are buying up land near military installations, food production, and digging into the state's fascination with unreliable energy sources built in China. The national security threat is tied to a second threat, perhaps a more pernicious threat, a threat to our economic security. Mr. Tinderholt also talked to us about the Chinese government dumping government-grade drones into the U.S. market at cut-rate prices. When Jean Wu was confronted with the CCP conducting espionage from a Houston consulate, he responded by touting the number of businesses Communist China operates in Texas. Surely, armed as we are with knowledge of history, we wouldn't accept the gift of a gilded wooden horse from our enemies, right? Unless, maybe, it was reading the Wall Street Journal and promised us cheap things and never-ending riches? Maybe. If you'd like to go deeper on this topic, see the original documents, and do your own follow-up research, visit texasscorecard.com slash China. This series is based on the original Texas Scorecard reporting of Robert Montoya, Kristen Stanchu, Daryl Frost, Emily Wilkerson, and Jesse Connor. I'm your host, Michael Quinn Sullivan. The Exposed Podcast is a production of Texas Scorecard. Texas Scorecard is the leading news outlet for Texas politics. Go to texasscorecard.com today. This episode was written and hosted by Michael Quinn Sullivan with audio production and direction by Drew Cook.